Amen. Aren't you thankful for choir being back in session? And look, at, there's even empty chairs. There's room for you still. We can fit you in there. This week has been kind of an interesting week, I think. Uh, we've got hurricanes that have happened, hurricanes that are getting ready to happen. We've got people that are helping out with disasters from a year ago. And I thought maybe this morning a reminder of Psalm 23 for our scripture, just something to bring us back and get us rooted back this morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. I think I'm on. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Forest Home. Stand with us this morning as we sing. a lot of the things that are that are going on and I was thinking about <clears throat> excuse me um, what to mention this morning during this time of of uh, reflection leading into in, into more worship um, but Psalm 62 yes my soul find rest in God my hope comes from him truly he is my rock and my salvation he is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock and my refuge. And no matter what, all the current events, things that are going on south of us, and we also bring our own, quote, current events into worship. Pour out your hearts to him. And God is our refuge. Man will 
tried to rule the world you made. But we know power is yours alone to give and take. A day will come when every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that you are Lord, both now and forever. Day after day.
So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, the Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. And you are stronger, and you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, the Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all.
Sometimes I wonder if that's really what we think. See, for us, we're not dealing with hurricanes right now. We go on our every day. We hear about it. We're not affected maybe like some. I actually Wednesday night talked with the teens about that same very thing. Trusting God through everything, through the good times and through the bad times, through the difficult times, through the easy times. Sometimes when it's easy, we forget to give God praise that's to his name. Sure, when the hurricane hits, when the tornadoes hit, when the difficult times come, we turn to God often. God, help me on this test today. Help me pass. If, if you help me pass, I promise I'll go serve somewhere this week. We often turn like that. So this week, hopefully, that's something that means something to you a little bit more through it all, giving God thanks and praise for all that he does for you on a daily basis. Several needs and requests to share with you this morning, and I encourage you to read through the list. In fact, you might see a name on there and you went, wow, I didn't know so-and-so still needed a prayer. I better check with them and see what's exactly going on. A few there on the top that have the little asterisk by them, Jerry Lindstetter and Pam Carlo still in the hospital. Uh, Pam was doing well last I heard. That was about Wednesday of this week, and so continue to follow up with them and pray for that family. Um, I had the privilege of taking three of their kids with us. We went to Dallas Friday and took some supplies down there, spent about six hours riding roller coasters at Six Flags, and drove back yesterday. So they're exhausted, I'm exhausted, but it's all part of the fun that we get to have. But continue to lift them up uh, during this time of prayer. Hurricane Harvey victims, I think we can go ahead and add Hurricane Irma victims as well because we know that's call coming. We've been hearing about it now for several days and looking for ways. There probably will be emails coming out. Be watching for ways that you can help in that area as well. Mission trip, we look a little low this morning and we've got about 12 or 15 that are on a mission trip right now. Pastor Ken's there with them and Miss Linda as well and uh, continue to lift them up traveling and uh, the impact that they're able to have in an area there. Ladies District Retreat is coming up and then Revival. We've been talking about it for a few weeks now. Revival coming up October 1st through 4th and uh, you won't want to miss that. Make sure you get that marked on your calendars now to be here and join us for those times. We're excited about what God is doing and uh, we want to spend a few moments in prayer. Would you stand with me and as we sing this song again, join us at the altars uh, for a time of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you the honor that's due your name. Father God, we can't help but be burdened for friends, for family, for ones that are hurting. We ask right now, God, that you would work in each situation. You know those needs. You know those times of difficulty they may be facing. Lord, we also think of those who are being displaced right now, the many hundreds and even in thousands that are losing homes, losing things that are so precious and dear to them, the pictures, the, the articles, the things that have become part of their life for many years, gone in an instant almost. Sure, we can empathize a little bit with that, because of what we've gone through a few years ago in the fire and the, and the many memories that were lost. God, I ask that you would help make it fresh on our minds as we think of them, looking for ways that we can help, ways that we can serve, ways that we can love, ways that we can encourage, and ways that we can lift our brothers and sisters up. Lord, for those in Florida who are preparing and embracing and uh, some that may even be trying to ride things out, protect them, give them safety. For the little kids who don't understand what's going on, give them comfort. Put your arms around them. For moms and dads that don't know what's going on, give them strength. Help them to be bold because you are there. Those times they talk about 
you being there and how real this must feel right now to know that you are there even in the middle of a hurricane, even in the middle of difficulties, helping them through. Lord, for our team that is helping and ministering and uh, worshiping today in another place, we just ask that you would be with them in these times of memories they're making, but also in a community that has uh, felt a wildfire that has gone through and devastated. Uh, something we heard about on the news again, but not something that we've dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. We ask that you would help them to be a light, a beacon to this community, to give them uh, the much needed rest that they may need from the many hours that they've continued to put in of cleanup. God, thank you for their willingness to go and to serve and to be used. We ask right now that you would give them the strength each and every day, that you would keep them safe while they're there and as they travel back to us. The stories we'll hear, I'm sure, of how you worked in and through their lives and are continuing to do so there. And Lord, we turn our attention this morning to our service and what you have for each one of us. We ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears to be attentive to what you want us to hear. To put aside the distractions of things we have going on later today, the Sunday school lesson we may need to teach, or whatever it is that is distracting us today, we ask that you would help us to hear from you, that we would be obedient, and that we would respond with arms of love and arms of service in ways that you want us to serve and to love you and to love others because of you. Be with us. We love you, and it's your name we pray this all. Amen. Let's sing that chorus day after day again. Day after day, our God is reigning. He's never shaken. See ya. Why are you? used to doing this every week. I had to look and think what was next. It must be offering time, and I need to pay attention a little bit more. We're thankful for your faithfulness and how you continue to serve. As I mentioned, we took several articles with us, some for, uh, for Hurricane Harvey, and actually, we took crisis care kits. We took seven banana boxes. Seven? Yeah. So, so let me just tell you the story. We had the 12-passenger van. I had 11 go with me. If you know anything about church vans, there's not a ton of storage in addition to... 11 people, and so my passenger was banana boxes and other items, and in the back was banana boxes, and sitting on kids' laps was banana boxes, not quite, but just about, but uh, just a testament of your faithfulness and uh, areas that you helped out with. The banana boxes, what was in those, by the way, was crisis care kits. We put six crisis care kits in there that have basic items like a toothbrush when you lose everything that you don't have, um, some towels, 
uh, some toothpaste and some shampoo and some basic needs like that. And so we took six times seven is, somebody do the math for me, 42. And uh, we took some of those down there. Those actually went to the convention center in Dallas, and you're sitting there going, well, why not all the way down to Houston? Well, because there were over 3,000 evacuees already at the convention center in Dallas that needed uh, some of those things. So thank, for, thank you for your faithfulness in helping out in that way. Be watching for more ways that you can help out here in the future. Ushers, will you join me here as we prepare to give of our morning tithes and offerings? Father God, thank you today for your faithfulness, for the ways that you continue to work in our lives and through our lives. Thank you for the opportunity we had this week to make a difference. We ask you would help us this week to look for ways that we can make a difference individually and collectively as a church. We love you. It's your name we pray this all. Amen. Before I sing, I shared this with the choir this morning, and I was asked to share it with you. This song that I'm singing is called Fear Not Tomorrow. And before I moved over here, I lived in Fort Smith and attended Kavanaugh Free Will Baptist Church. And there was a couple there that uh, we just kind of clicked. And sweet, sweet people. And she is about 84 now. And he's in a nursing home. They're both facing a lot of health issues. And all along, since I started singing this song, she calls it her song. And she would send me a message, or she would call me and say, Gail, I want you to sing my song. And so this week on Facebook, she had posted a prayer request that um, she, they were really facing some hard, hard times. And so she said, Gail, I really would like to hear you sing my song. So I picked up the phone, and I called her. <clears throat> And I sang to her, and she cried the whole time. There are so many of us who are facing things that we just don't understand and that we can't, we can't get our hand around an answer. But we really need to fear not tomorrow because God is already there. In this age of uncertainty, questions come to my mind. What is waiting ahead for me and the rest of mankind? Fear not tomorrow, God is all. course you'll take he sees each hidden snare he's waiting to guide you through each burden and care fear not tomorrow God is already Are you troubled of things to come? Is your future unsure? Are you dreading the coming dawn? A long day to endure. Fear not tomorrow. God is course you'll take he sees each hidden snare he's waiting to guide you through each burden and care fear not tomorrow God is already
Aren't you, aren't you glad Gail Pyle came to be with us at Forest Home? Beautiful. Of course, now she has already preached my sermon for me. So we ought to just get a cup of coffee and go to Sunday school, I think. It's good to be among friends. Some of you are confused, like I am. Some of you were here in June when I was ordained, and some of you had the questions, are you going to be preaching? And I said, no, I'm being ordained as a deacon. Church of the Nazarene, if you're in a full-time, if you feel called to full-time ministry, but not preaching, you're a deacon. If you, if you feel a call to preach, you're an elder. Pastor Ken is an elder. I am not. But I did feel like God was putting something on my heart a few weeks back, and I started writing some things down in my devotions. And it wasn't just two or three weeks later, and Pastor Ken said to me, hey, I've got, I've got to be gone in um, September. Would you have a testimony you could bring or something? And I said, you know what? Actually, God's kind of been putting something on my heart. He said, okay. So that's why I'm here. And then on, so I set, set the music all together for today. And I, hasn't it just been so great of how God has used Gail's song to go along with everything else that's gone on? And it's the topic of my message, but as of Wednesday night, I didn't realize that. I was planning on going a different direction. And Thursday morning, I came to the office really ready to really bear down on this message. And um, God took me a different direction, and it took me exactly in that same direction. So you have already heard the message. I'm going to expound a little bit, but you've already heard the message. God's already in our tomorrows. Amen. This is the second time in my life that I have spoken. By the way, this is not a sermon. I don't know the difference between a devotional and a sermon, but I think from best I can tell from Pastor Pete and Pastor Ken, it has to do with wearing a tie. <laughs> so this is a devotional, okay? Second time in my life, first time in my life that I ever was supposed to be the speaker for an evening server for a main service was in Panama almost three years ago. And um, actually almost four years ago. And I was told that morning, their work, work and witness trip, I was told, oh, you're a pastor, you're speaking tonight. And I said, what, what, what? I had zero time to prepare. I had limited Wi-Fi or internet. I mean, you know most of these pastors get their messages off of sermons.com. <laughs> I didn't, because I don't have a subscription. But um, I, was, I was lost. So first, I didn't have anything prepared. Number two, I, uh, I was speaking through a translator. I don't speak Spanish, they didn't speak English, and my Aaronisms, they don't come through a translator. I spoke for, uh, I think, five or six minutes, and it was really, really, it just wasn't good. And I had a friend there, and he had been really sick, and he came that night, and I said, friend, I said, I hope you get better. He said, my goodness, boy, I hope you do too. <laughs> so, I don't know what this is going to be this morning, but I'm excited to, uh, to share with you. Uh, if you'll stand for the script, uh, reading of the scripture this morning. We're calling this a word to the worried. And we're reading from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has trouble of its own. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Gail's song rem reminding us that you've got this. You have a plan for our lives. And Lord, we thank you for that so much. 
pray you be in this service today. I pray, Lord, you would direct my thoughts, that I would glorify you in everything that's done and said. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Worrying is something that we all tend to do when something important is on the horizon, even if we try not to. But it is important for Christians to realize what worry actually is, a good way to pass the time. You see, worrying about things is a wonderful hobby for people to pick up because it doesn't take much practice and it is safe for all ages. Worrying may not solve any of your problems, but it certainly won't make them any worse. And if you have a lot of time on your hands, you might as well spend it fretting and pacing with your heart full of worry. In fact, worrying is a sign of caring about something. So instead of telling your family that you love them, just spend a lot of time worrying about them and they'll figure out that you care about them. And since worrying will probably put you in an early grave, you'll get to heaven even faster. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. Pastor Pete has set us up beautifully this morning. He's told you about all the things been going on. He didn't go back quite as far. Pastor Ken went back before that. You know, we had, um, before all this nonsense we have going on now, we had the Democrats and, Re and Republicans. Anyone heard, heard much from them recently? No, now we're talking to them. We talked about Charlottesville, and now we're talking about, about all these storms that are coming. There's plenty to worry about, plenty to worry about. But in this passage, it says, don't worry. I like what Rick Warren said. Rick Warren said, worry is unreasonable. To worry about something you can't change is useless. To worry about something you can change is foolish. And every time you review a worry in your mind, it just gets bigger. Worry amplifies problems out of proportion. Number two, worry is unnatural. You weren't born to worry. It's a learned response to life. In fact, you have to practice to get good at it. Any, anyone want to confess that you've gotten pretty good at it? Fortunately, worry can be unlearned. The only species, I like this, the only species in God's creation that worries is human beings. Why do we worry? We worry because we think God doesn't care. Worry is un unhelpful. It doesn't work. It can't change the past. It can't control the future. It only makes you miserable today. Worrying about a problem never solves the problem. Number four, worry is unnecessary. God has promised to take care of you if you'll trust him with the details of your life. As a child, if you ask your father for lunch money, you didn't worry about where it came from. That was his problem. Let God be God in your life. God will take care of you. Just have faith. Now, I'm sure there's some of you that are looking at me and say, Aaron, you're, you're, you don't understand. If you knew what was going on in my life, you would... Um, you might have a different feeling about it. To say that worry is unreasonable, unnatural, unhelpful, unnecessary, it sounds good, but when the hard times come, what do you expect? This is not to pretend that there's nothing, that we don't have troubles. John, John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This passage isn't telling us to ignore our challenges, ignore our problems, because they're going to be there. But act on your problems, but worry isn't the, isn't the proper response. You're going to have physical issues. Go to the doctor, but don't worry. A lot of you are going to have financial issues. You know what? Take the Dave Ramsey class. Take financial peace, and don't worry. There's going to be ice storms in Arkansas. Get the milk and the bread, but don't worry. There's no point in it. I know that... Uh, so, so, so we've covered the worry part, and, and, you, and you know it's unreasonable, unnatural, and unhelpful, and unnecessary. So let, let, let's move on to, to what I believe are some solutions. How do you conquer worry? I believe one reason is, is one way is to live as if life is temporary, because it is. You realize this isn't all there is. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we have a hope? He's gone to prepare a place for us. At my last church, I was... Um, I was a carpenter for years, a lot of you know that, and back in 2008, um, our worship pastor resigned from our church, and our senior pastor at the time, he liked to hire people as interim, interim meaning someone who would just come do, do, the, do the, bare, the bare basics of the job, not be full-time, 
and uh, he liked to hire interim leaders in various, various positions um, so he could kind of see which direction they needed to go. So our, our worship pastor left, and he said to me, Aaron, would you be our interim worship pastor? I said, I'd love to. Our choir at the time was about 70, 75 people, and the band was big, and I thought, what in the world am I doing? I had no idea. But I loved it. I loved leading the choir. I loved learning to work with the band. I'm still learning to work with the band. I loved leading those people into worship. My first service was the first Sunday in, or I'm sorry, the last Sunday in December. And I kept being interim all the way January, February, March, April, May. Coming into June, I started, I was enjoying it so much, and the pastor was telling me, hey, you might be, I'm thinking about you as being one of my potential candidates. And June came, and July started coming, and I thought, all right. I started to worry, and I said, Lord, where's this going? What am I doing? I went to my senior pastor. I said, look, it's time for you to either hire me or hire the next guy. I don't know who it is. I don't really care at this moment. But I was worried because I was thinking, what am I going to do? If, if, if I don't get hired, what am I going to do? I, I'm not going to be happy going back to the congregation. I'm loving leading worship. What am I going to do? And so I went to him, and I said, look, it's time for you to hire whoever it's going to be. And he looked at me. He said, Aaron, he said, we're all interim. He said, none of us are guaranteed anything beyond today. And I thought, you know what? That's a pretty good example. And if, you'll, if, if you would know all of my, a lot of my passwords for things, interim is a big part of a lot of that because I embrace that. And I said, you know what? Nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary. And I learned to hold things like this. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because days are evil. Another way to conquer worry is not just living as if life is temporary, but it's by counting your blessings because you have many. I read a story about a man who was leading worship at a leper colony on the island of Tobago. And a woman who had been facing away from the pulpit turned around and he said it was the most hideous face I had ever seen the woman's nose and ears were entirely gone, and she lifted a fingerless hand in the air and asked, can we sing Count Your Many Blessings? Overcome with emotion, he left the service, and he was followed by a team member who said, I guess you'll never be able to sing that song again. He said, oh, yes, I will, but I'll never sing it the same way. Have you ever counted your blessings? Have you ever literally got a piece of paper and written down the blessings in your life. Zig Ziglar told a story one time about the man he encountered at one of his speaking engagements who came up to him and said, I hate my job. All this positive thinking stuff, that's fine for you, but I hate my job. There's nothing I like about my job. Zig said, there's nothing you like about your job? Nope, there's nothing I like my job. He said, well, get a piece of paper. Let's see if we can't find something you like about your job. He said, when you go to work, do you have a uh, parking place or do you have to park your car in the street? He said, well, of course I have a parking place. He said, write it down. He said, do they give you a desk or do you have to sit on the floor? Well, of course I have a desk. He said, write it down. Do they pay you for what you do there? Of course they pay me. Write it down. It wasn't too long until the man said, you know what? I think I like my job a little more than I thought I did. I don't know what it is that's vexing you these days, but maybe counting your blessings, not focusing quite so much on you, and counting what God has done for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And my third reason how to conquer worry is not is by living life as if it's temporary, counting your blessings, and by remembering that God has a plan for your life because he cares about you and your situation. Most of you know um, Katrina and I have two Arkansans living with us that we didn't have when we came here. Our story is we came to Jonesboro in the summer of 2015 and we, we thought we were about ready for the empty nest. Kristen went to college way up by Chicago. Tyler was going to Jonesboro High School and he was working nearly full time at Chick-fil-A. And me and Mama found ourselves, after looking forward to the empty nest, we found ourselves really not liking it at all. We found ourselves sitting in the chair, 
looking at stupid stuff on TV every night. And we thought, there's got to be more than this. What else is there? It was about November, early in November, that we were thinking about this and talking about it. And I remember, for some reason, I don't know what triggered it on my mind, but foster care came to my mind. And I found something on Facebook for a foster care group here in Jonesboro, didn't know who it was. And on November 19th, I sent a text to a lady that I didn't know, and I said, we're thinking about being a part of foster care, we'd like more information. 11 days went, and I'd never received anything. On November the 30th, I received a text that said, I'm not sure how I missed your text, but our next meeting is tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Now, this lady was Nicole Pott. Some of you know her, and John works with her now. John, I hope you're helping her with her communications because she needs some help with that. If you can help her with that, that'd be wonderful. She's helping you. <laughs> Well, we went to the meeting wanting more information. We walked out of there. If you know Nicole, she is, she's a character. We walked out of there. We had already signed some papers, and we were on our way. Our kids came home. We told them about it. Um, or Kristen came home from college. We told them about it. They were all, all in favor of it. And uh, so we sent off for the background checks. They said, come from Indiana. Your background checks may, might take a little while. They didn't take a little while. They took forever. Uh, at one point, I called Little Rock, and I said, what's going on with the background checks? Well, there's been a problem. Now, I never found out if they had found out something in Katrina's past <laughs> or if there was just some red tape getting from here to there. Anyways, in about April, they had told us the entire foster process was supposed to take six to eight months, maybe. Well, for us, we, had, we, we were into it four or five months, hadn't started much of anything. Finally, in April, we had a, we had a home visit. Finally, then they, uh, they, they, we, we went and we were fingerprinted. We started classes in June. Classes went fine. Home visits, everything was going fine up until September, early in, or late, late August, actually. And we thought, we're about ready to open. And we were all excited. And then we get a phone call. Hey, uh, Katrina's fingerprints had a problem. What kind of problem now? Well, you have to, go to, you have to take this this form, which of course you all know Jonesboro's mail system, they sent it from the DHS office right over here on um, Brown's Access. They sent it to Memphis for us who live just right over here, which made a lot of sense. So it took an entire week to get to us. Then she got to go to the state police headquarters, be fingerprinted, and then, off, and then they sent them in. We brought them back to the lady. I said, okay, what does this mean? Is this a couple days? Is this a couple weeks? It's out of my hands. What does that mean? It's out of my hands. So, okay. That was end of August, September, October came. In November, finally, they told us the, la the first Friday in November, they said, okay, you're open for, for, you're open for, for, uh, for foster care, you're good to go. Well, normally the stories that we hear, when, once you're open, you're open and you start getting calls almost immediately because the need is great. No calls Friday night, no calls Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Finally, I'm texting the lady, um, is our phone working? What's going on here? And finally, Tuesday, I get an email that came through that showed that we were somehow in the system, and suddenly our, our phone started calling, ringing on Wednesday. We're talking about the day after the election, November the 9th. Our phone started ringing. The first call we got was from West Memphis, and it was for a little four-year-old boy and a, and a six-year-old girl, Hispanic, and the little four-year-old boy did not speak English. Katrina decided she didn't want that. She said, it's too far for visits, too far for court. I can't speak Spanish. No. All, all together that day, we turned down seven kids. They just weren't what we could take care of, and we knew that. The next morning, that, that night after choir rehearsal, we sat at home for a long time, and we talked about what kids can we take, and what can I say yes to without her permission. You know, we're, we're talking about all these things. The next morning was my day off and her day off. And I was sitting in the chair at the house about ready to tackle a theology class that I really didn't want to do. And the phone rings. And it was a lady on the other end of the line from Lawrence County. I didn't know where Lawrence County was. And she said, we have newborn twins that were born yesterday. Can you take them? And I started giggling because I knew how much Katrina loved babies. And I walked into the, uh, to our bedroom where she was still sleeping. 
And I, let me just tell you, without telling any tales out of school, she is not always the beautiful, gracious lady you see here when she's waking up. She's normally otherwise. And that morning I walked and I said, Katrina, you're going to want to hear this. I said, they have newborn twins and they're wondering if we can take them. And she woke up with a smile. And she, without having any more information than that, she said, yes. And I told the lady on the other end of the phone, I said, she says, yes, we can take them. And this is what showed up at our door three days later. Well, it wasn't quite like this. That's Shelly's business, how they're all wrapped up like that. But that's what showed up at our door on November 12th last year. This is what they look like now. Y'all have seen them grow up. That was our family the first Sunday of our, of our uh, new building, October 2nd. Don't we look lonely? <laughs> Don't we look, we look tanned and well-rested? This is Easter. Don't we look stressed but happy? You know, looking back at our story, I think... While we were going through all that business, it didn't make any sense to us. Why were we so behind? Why, 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 couldn't, why couldn't our process work the same way other people's processes worked? It was 51 weeks from the time I sent the first text till they showed up on our doorstep. Why did we have all the, all the troubles that we had? You know what I think it is? I believe it was God saying, you know what? Those twins, they're not gonna be born until November the 9th. So let's hold up the paperwork over here. Let's cause this thing to happen. Let's cause a problem in their Indiana background check because I have a plan for their lives and we're not ready for them yet. I don't know what you're going through in your life, but I can only believe that if a couple, a couple kids that had born with drug drugs in their system, that uh, whose parents couldn't take care of them, were unplanned. I can only believe that he cares for me. And that worrying's not gonna help me in the slightest amount. But if I put, put my trust in him, he has a plan for my life, amen? Consider the lilies, they don't toil or spin, but there's not a king with more splendor than them. Consider the sparrows, they don't plant nor sow. But they're fed by the Master who watches them grow. We have a Heavenly Father above with eyes full of mercy and a heart filled When to shine, he kisses the flowers each morning with dew. I like this part. And he's not too busy to care about you.
this morning you were given something something precious something irreplaceable something you will never have again something that's a gift that something is today it's a chance to love your children with reckless abandon and not let the hurts of your childhood be repeated with them It's a chance to live out your faith in the nine to five instead of compartmentalizing the sacred and secular. It's a chance to be the hands and feet of Christ in a dying world. It's a chance to start fresh, new, to make a change. Head down the road towards who you were meant to be. It's a chance to cling to the words of Christ, to experience life and experience it abundantly. Or you could play it safe today, not risk and maybe put it off until tomorrow. The only problem with that is tomorrow might not come. I sure appreciate him sharing the story and reminding us of the fact that God cares about us and that we do have a hope. That's a hope that's in him. So let's stand this morning and sing. And yeah, there's Mona right there looking for Mona. <laughs> Oh, 
Next week's a perfect opportunity for you to invite someone to join us here to enjoy what you enjoy. Does that make any sense? Back to Church Sunday is next Sunday with the band Remnant. The only thing we need to know from you is whether you're coming and going to have lunch and your friends that are coming with you are going to have lunch. I think we need to know by Wednesday how many are coming with you. $8 per person. It's catered from Demos, if I remember correctly. And so you'll want to be here, be a part of that. Uh, the band Remnant was with us a few years ago. Some of you might remember that outside at the pack. It was much colder there than I think it will be in here. Might enjoy it a little bit more here, but they were fantastic and a great, uh, great group to be here with us. And just a perfect opportunity for you to invite somebody back. The other thing you need to know about, if you don't have it on your calendars yet, make sure that you have October 1st through 4th on your calendar. 1st through 4th is Revival. I went out of order, sorry, Danielle. October 1st through 4th is Revival. Great time to be here. Perfect things to invite ones to as well. Our children's ministry will have Terry Hedges with them. They definitely won't want to miss it because he's fantastic, does some, uh, some magic and illusions and things like that, so perfect thing there. And the last thing you saw there on the screen, starting tomorrow night for the months of September and October, open gym night. You've been wanting your chance. The teens have been in there. The children have been in there. Here's a perfect opportunity for you to come, have some fun. Nothing is scheduled exactly. We'll see who shows up. If you want to play volleyball, they'll play volleyball. If they want to play basketball, play basketball. Maybe they'll do both. Maybe they'll start a whole new game that I don't know anything about, uh, whatever it is. If you have your kids, your kids can come. Don't just bring them. It's not babysitting service. Don't just bring them and drop them off and say, Matt Stallings will take care of them all. He's a fantastic guy. He probably would, knowing Matt, he would just do that, but that's not necessarily what it's intended for. Hope you have a great day today. Go to Sunday school, grab a cup of coffee on your way, and uh, tell Pastor Ken you missed him as well. <laughs>